Mars has been looked at through telescopes since the seven, mid 1700s. Uh, William Herschel has done an awful lot of observing through his telescopes. And in fact, it was Herschel who found not only the, not only found the polar ice caps, but he also found the fact that Mars does uh, show changes throughout its year. Uh, he thought that the that uh, Mars had a lot of similarities to Earth, and uh, but he never ever said that there is definitely people on them. Uh, 1854, uh, <clears throat> there was speculation uh, about Mars because it seemed like Mars had land areas and seas and, and the like. <clears throat> and uh, later on, a, a man by the name of Giovanni Schiaparelli uh, was looking at Mars through his telescopes and he try to define some of those light and dark areas. Uh, through, through some years of watching Mars, those, those light and dark areas became a lot more specific. And um, you know, he's, he's been credited with uh, possibly causing a mistake that uh, caused uh, Percival Lowell to call these uh, areas uh, uh, canals as opposed to channels. But actually, if you were to take a look at uh, Schiaparelli's uh, pictures, this, is, this was done in 1888. And uh, that looks that looks pretty man-made to me. I think I don't think it was uh, really a mistake uh, on Chaparelli's uh, part. I mean, it looks like there's something built on that planet. At the same time this was going on, uh, Drake University was founded and was going through its earliest histories. Uh, the uh, Old Main was built in 1881, uh, and uh, it was about 1897 that a uh, Minnesonian, is that how you say it? Minnesonan? Anyway, some guy from Minnesota uh, decided he was going to go to Drake because the schools that he went to up in Excelsior, Minnesota, had all either closed or burned down. That man was Dan Morehouse. And Dan having a pioneer upbringing uh, was, was definitely up to the task of not only going to college and learning, but he's also part of the football team. And uh, he decided that uh, he was going to make Drake his career uh, to help fund his uh, career. He actually worked uh, almost full time at Yonkers downtown in the men's department. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Morehouse uh, actually became more and more interested in science. The new science building, which was originally built in 1893, uh, had a new addition to it about the same time that Morehouse got there, and that was a telescope uh, that was donated to the university by uh, Francis Marion Drake, one of the founders, and it was a research grade instrument. Uh, to house it, the uh, university built that four story building with the dome on top. Uh, unfortunately, there is no real true foundation to that building. And as a result, every time the trolley passed, uh, that whole structure would shake, which uh, didn't help anything. So in 1897, uh, Dan Morehouse was learning more and more about astronomy. Uh, He took his science courses 
and uh, finally uh, graduated in 1900 with a BS degree. At the same time, uh, he was taking courses up at the University of Chicago. Uh, he graduated uh, up there with a bachelor's degree in 1902, and then came and at the same time uh, graduated from Drake with a master's degree in 1902. So uh, Morehouse did an awful lot uh, in astronomy at, at that particular point, and Drake hired him as an astronomy instructor. Meanwhile, around that same time, way out west in Flagstaff, Arizona, a businessman by the name of Percival Lowell built his personal observatory. And he decided he was going to make a name for himself. First of all, he made a tremendous name for himself uh, with the fact that his telescope was 24 inches in diameter and was about that particular point about the largest thing uh, west of the Mississippi. So he built his observatory and immediately he was look his, his life's aim was to basically look at Mars or at least discover planets. And you see one of his early drawings of Mars right there. And later on those drawings got a little bit more defined uh, to the point where there was no doubt if you were to look at that, it was definitely showing there was life on Mars and not only intelligent life, but life that was probably more technologically advanced than anyone on Earth. So this caused quite a, a, a stir on Earth. Uh, the, New, the New York Times uh, during one of its Sunday papers had a whole article on that. You know, there is, there is life on the planet Mars. I mean, there's no two ways about that. Um, in fact, uh, later on, there was an article uh, in the World magazine that the thirsty people of Mars were building longer and longer canals in order to get the water from the poles to the mid-latitude areas. So there was just no mistaking that there was life on Mars. What's interesting is that by this is by the early 20th century, um, telescopes had improved to the point where it seemed like no one else could find these canals on Mars. It was only a uh, Lowell that was finding these uh, canals on Mars. But uh, Percival Lowell. Uh, persevered, boy, there's an alliteration, and he maintained that Mars had an intelligent and uh, uh, had an intelligent population, and they were building canals that were thousands of miles long. Editorials uh, echoed that fact that Mars was inhabited. And not only that, but 13 years after this particular article in 1920, uh, they agreed that we should be hearing uh, some type of, uh, of radio signal coming from Mars, because it's obvious that they were technologically advanced enough to be able to build a radio. So people were waiting to hear something from Mars. When I got into astronomy, I was probably somewhere in the vicinity around eight or nine years old. And one of the first books I owned was this one, Exploring Mars by Roy Gallant. And these were the pictures 
of Mars that were used in this book. And as a result, I this is 1956, and I felt for sure that there was life on Mars. And in fact, other people who not only used this book, but believed that there was life elsewhere out in the universe, uh, had a lot to say about that. We have War of the Worlds. We have uh, in Mars Attacks, uh, we have the fact that advanced civilizations are by definition peaceful. And of course, we have the fact that we have aliens that serve man, but they actually serve him for lunch. When uh, the Hubble Space Telescope finally took uh, look, took a look at Mars, they actually looked at this particular area that this book uh, happened to zero in on. And what they have is the fact that, that once again, there are no canals. Uh, it's pretty obvious that those canals are a figment and uh, of somebody's imagination and uh, I don't think I got the message at that particular point. Um, because on July 14th, 1965, the first Mariner 4 uh, photograph of Mars came in and I was absolutely devastated. I was actually set to give my first first public lecture. This happened on a Wednesday. I was scheduled to give my first public lecture on that Saturday. And I felt like crying. I felt like I lost the planet. I mean, what happened to all the people? It's obvious that there's no people on there because there's craters. And if there's craters, then obviously they've all been killed by all the meteors that came down. But um, anyway, but at this particular point, uh, astronomers were first looking on how do we find other planets out there? And the first exoplanet that was discovered was actually in 1992. It happened to be a, a planet that was orbiting a, um, a pulsar. And what, what happened was this, pul you know, pulsars are stars that have basically, they are dead stars. They are, uh, uh, turning very quickly on their axes, uh, usually several times to several hundred times per minute. And these intervals from one revolution to the next are staggeringly accurate. In other words, one is exactly like the other. They were watching this particular pulsar and they found that its pulses occasionally would vary. So there was something that was interfering with, the, or with this pulsar that was turning uh, actually once every six thousandths of a second. So something was getting in the way and an astronomer deduced that what was getting in the way was a planet. There was a planet orbiting it, and this planet was actually interfering with the precise turning of this pulsar. Now, if you think about it, this pulsar is giving off a great deal of energy. So anything on that planet probably would have been baked, fried, or microwaved 
uh, to the point where they're probably all zombies on that planet. So they called it the zombie planet. And sure enough, anything on that planet would have definitely been zombied. The, when astronomers started looking out into our solar system and sending out probes, one of those probes was a, was a probe going to Jupiter. It was called Galileo. And just out of curiosity, they said, I wonder, you know, that, that probe was going to pass by the Earth twice. I wonder if we turn the sensors toward Earth, if we could actually get information that would confirm that there is life on Earth. I mean, that's pretty important when you're trying to figure out how to find life in the universe. If your probes can't find it on something that they know there's life on. So they set their probes to investigate the Earth on December 8th, 1990, Galileo turned its sensors toward Earth and found life. Well, what it found, it found oxygen and methane, and uh, it found a spike in the infrared part of the light spectrum. It's called the red ed edge. It's the telltale sign of reflective vegetation. Galileo even detected what today might be called a techno signature. What is a techno signature? Television. It found television on the planet. So it's this these powerful radio waves are were a definite sign that there is definitely life on the earth. The second question is, is it intelligent? And that's still up for grabs. Well, astronomers were still trying to figure out how to find, um, well, actually find planets out there. And actually the fall part of the sky actually holds two success stories and a project that yielded an amazing amount of results. We have the discovery of Epsilon Andromeda. We have 51 Pegasi. And we have Kepler's Playground. Those three areas uh, actually provided uh, proof of several thousand planets. So we'll talk, we'll talk about each one first. So what are the ways that they, that they discovered planets? Well, actually the first way is using something called astrometrics. Um, we know that things will, we know that orbits, well, actually planets orbiting each other will go around a common center of gravity. This is called the Barry Center. If one of those planets is a great deal more massive than the other one, then the Barry Center moves toward the more massive planet. And if we actually have a, su a sun where the uh, planet goes around, we find that even the sun will show um, the results of, uh, of orbiting gravitational bodies. Our sun does this. Our sun does not stay in the exact same spot. The planets pull on it. And as a result, our sun actually moves 
well, actually a couple of hundred thousand miles in each direction as Jupiter and the rest of the solar system move around it. So what we have is a, a star that will move slightly. Actually, it, it, it etches out a small circle. And we could actually determine, you know, what is going around that, uh, that star because we can measure the Doppler shift of that star. Now, you know that Doppler shift is actually the changing of, well, in this case, it would be the changing of wavelengths due to the motion of a star or a planet or galaxies or uh, even gas. So if something is redshifted, it's moving away from you. If something is moving toward you, it's blue shifted. And this would be a difference from its uh, at rest spectrum. So if we have a planet revolving about a star, we can actually determine how much of a circle the star will make by measuring its uh, Doppler shift. So as it's moving toward you, the, the, these, the spectrum shifts to the blue side. As it moves away from you, it shifts to the red side. And how much it shifts would give its velocity. So if we're looking at stellar wobble, we can determine what the unseen object is, its mass, and how long it takes to go around that star due to its Doppler shift. So it's a tremendously powerful tool. The first planet seen, actually figured, going around a normal star was 51 Pegasi. As you can see, its period was about four and a fifth day, four and a quarter days. And they were able to determine that there was a planet going around it. Uh, 51 Pegasi is about 51 light years away. And the planet that was going around it, let's see if I can find something here, was actually uh, larger than the planet Jupiter. So it was a huge planet. And as a result, this, this motion that 51 Pegasi was going through was pretty exaggerated. 51 Pegasi is actually a part of the great square of Pegasus. And if you lived on, on 50 on the planet going around uh, Pegasi, it was originally called Bellerophon, but later renamed Dimidium. I don't know why. That doesn't make any sense to me. Anyway, so this is the first planet that was found going around a normal star. Uh, the planet, uh, it was the, the mass was at least 150 times that of the Earth. Now, the next planet that was found, actually, it was the first multi-planet system that was in 1997 and that was Epsilon uh, Andromeda. You can see Andromeda there and this is a really a lot of the sky. 
Um, by the way, Andromeda is about the size of four uh, full moons. So that'll give an idea of how much of the sky this is covering. Uh, they found uh, Epsilon Andromeda. Andromeda. Uh, it was uh, about 44 light years away. And watching it again by using the uh, wobbly planet, wobbly star method, they found that it actually had two, I'm sorry, three planets going around it. The dotted lines are actually the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So you can see that they, these uh, planets were very similar to the, some of the distances of our own planets in our solar system. Comparing them, you can see that one of the planets uh, smaller than the Earth actually took a little bit less than five days to go around it. The uh, next planet about the size of the Earth uh, took just a little bit longer than Venus. And finally, the last planet uh, took considerably longer to re revolve about the planet. What made this thing so amazing was the fact that water was detected. And it was the first proof that water is anything but rare in our solar system. In fact, uh, some scientists say that water is the most common molecule in our solar system, which is a long, a long way from what they were saying at the time of uh, Mr. Gallant's book, Discovering Mars, uh, because at that time, they thought that Earth was the only one that had water going on it. Now, in order to get these results, it, the time involved takes years, years of observing. So scientists wanted to find a better way, actually a faster way of finding these planets going around other you know, distant stars. And they actually came up with something rather ingenious. If you're watching a star and it suddenly disappears, well, the thing that you might think of most is the fact that something passed in front of it. That kind of makes sense. If something passes in front, you can't see it. I don't think there's any uh, any reaction that would actually dim a star for a couple of hours or even a couple of days and then come back to its normal brightness. So they started looking at something called binary stars or two stars going around each other. And they actually saw a, a definite dip in the light output of the particular system. And they said, well, why can't we do that with planets? Why can't we be watching a planet, I'm watching a star, and see a planet go across it? This happens to be uh, Venus going across the face of the sun. But as you can see, it does block some of the light coming from that star. Not very much. So whatever instruments we use have got to be very sensitive. So if we're, if we're living on Mars, we can actually see the moons of Mars block out the sun as they move across the face of the sun. So this would be some way of looking at how bright the sun would be on Mars. So those Martians are watching. This would be the equivalent of a Martian eclipse, by the way. So 
not very impressive. Oh, well. Anyway, so if we're watching an object move across a star, you can see that the light output definitely dips while that object moves across the, sun, the, uh, the face of that star. We can actually use that as a way of determining not only the size of the star, but also the size of the planet that is actually moving across that star. If we watch the light curve on that, we can see how the light curve changes as the object moves across, first of all, the surface of the star and then moves behind the star. So it would be a simple, uh, simple matter to build a spacecraft that would watch essentially eclipses, millions of them over a period of years to see how planets would block the light from their principal stars. That probe is called Kepler. And Kepler uh, actually uh, was launched in 2009. It finished all of its tasks in 2018. And it actually watched more than 500,000 stars. It was an amazing piece of technology. And basically anything that passed in front of it, if it involved blocking a part of that star, uh, there was information, there was definite information on planets, if any, that were going around that star. So it was looking for planets that were transiting their stars. So you can see the difference between these planets that were transiting and the planets that do not transit. So it was only going to be looking for planets that transit. Next, where was it going to look? Well, here's our galaxy. And uh, well, where's the sun in all this? The sun is right there. And it was going to look basically in two directions. It had two missions. One of them was the original mission to find planets. The other one was going to uh, find planets, but in, an, but in a different way. So it had two different missions. And in the process of doing that, uh, it was looking at a tiny little piece of the sky, roughly 5% of the sky was covered by the Kepler spacecraft. That was it, only 5%. And there you have the, uh, how it was looking, it was looking toward the uh, constellation of Cygnus, which is just a little bit off the Milky Way. And then after it found a planet, or it found what could be a planet, that sighting was confirmed by uh, this particular telescope uh, that actually used something called interferometry so that it is able to actually see that planet going around that star. So not only did they have to find the planet, but it also had to be confirmed. And this is what it saw. So you can see it's, you know, the, uh, uh, the footprint of that particular 
uh, camera. And over time, it picked up lots and lots of planets. You can see that they varied anything from Earth-sized to super earth size, which would take it about twice the size of the Earth. Or you can see Neptune size. And finally, you have giant planet size, which would actually be larger than Jupiter. As of 2012, in other words, after three years of doing its mission, it had spotted more than 20 500 possible transiting planets, including 60 that were in what scientists call the habitable zone. And we'll get into that in a minute. So this is how they saw those particular planets. And that little one that's underneath that big one, though, they'll just get a closer look at it that would actually be our sun. And that black dot would be Jupiter moving across it. So that's how Jupiter, a Jupiter-sized planet, moving across our sun, that's what it would look like. So now, now that they had all this information, they actually made a graphic that had all of these planets going around the stars. I like this, but it doesn't say anything. <laughs> Just looks neat. They call this the Kepler Orrery. Anyway, the final, the final tally was the fact that it spent just under 10 years in space it looked at more than 530,000 stars. It confirmed 2,662 planets going around those stars. In the process of doing that, it also found 61 supernova documented from the time that they started getting brighter. That's if, if it did nothing more than that, it would have been a major accomplishment. Because what gives astronomers the knowledge about supernovas is the fact that they have to watch it from the time that it first starts to get bright. And Kepler was right there. So it was a tremendous, tremendous success. So now they had planets. They had almost 3,000 planets that they, they can look at and maybe try to determine if there's life on it. Now, how could, what do we need on these planets in order to have life? Well, let's take a look at one of us. And what do we need in order to live? A human needs uh, the right temperature. Uh, they need water, or in some cases, beer, uh, some type of sustenance. If brownies would be good. Cookies, they need oxygen. 10% would be a minimum. They need gravity. It's been shown that the lack of gravity or, or less gravity would be detrimental to the human, uh, to a human body. We need sleep. Some of us need a lot of sleep. Some of us just go to sleep while we're sitting here talking. Oh, anyway. um, and the most important thing in order to get life off the ground we need to have non-ionizing radiation. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So what is it that every planet needs? It needs to have the right temperature in order to have the right water. Water 
needs to be a liquid because our cells are made up of mostly water. So we need to have the right temperature in order to have liquid water. And they're calling that the habitable zone. So we're looking for a place where water could be a liquid. And we're calling that the habitable zone. If it's too close, it's too hot. If it's too far away, it's too cold. That's pretty simple. And what makes things kind of interesting is the fact that there's a whole variety of normal stars. We have stars that are really hot. And we have stars that are not so hot. Our star puts our habitable zone. Actually, our Earth is on the inner edge of the habitable zone, while Mars is inside the habitable zone. And the hotter the star gets, the more the habitable zone is skewed away from that star. But how do we know what's going on on a planet? Well, scientists, astronomers, will take the spectrum of that solar system when the planet is not in front, or actually it could be in front of, but when the planet is somewhere in the view of that telescope. And then they'll take another spectrum when that planet is actually behind the star so that we can't get the spectrum of that planet. We can eliminate then the spectrum of that star and what we're left with is the spectrum of that planet. So we can tell what's going on on that planet by taking its spectrum and then eliminating the spectrum of that star. So they've been able to take a look at all of these stars, all 500,000 of them, and they found that there are about 60 that fall into a habitable zone. Here are the, shall we say, this is the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the top 19 and they are ranked according to distance. So you can see that Proxima Centauri has a planet going around it. It's 4.2 light years away. Uh, Tau Ceti is 12 light years away. And this would be the approximate size of the planet. And you can see the Earth on the other side compared to the Earth. So you can see some planets are larger, some planets are smaller. And if we were to actually list the top 20 uh, planets that are most like the Earth, it would look like this. And suddenly you're seeing names, you have no idea what it is. And the uh, to, to read, you can see it says M warm Terran. The M stands for the type of star. So it would so be an M type star. Then you have a K type star, which is actually a white star. Then you have a G type star, which is a yellow white star. The M stars are red dwarf stars. And then way on the right side, you have something called an ESI. An ESI is the Earth Similarity Index. What in the world is that? I mean, does that make life possible on these things? Well, 
to some people it might, but actually the Earth similarity index, it's a number between zero and one. Earth would be one, so it'd be like the Earth. Uh, any exoplanet with an ESI above eight could be considered Earth-like. So it would have a similar size, a similar uh, composition, uh, it have a, a similar, maybe a similar atmosphere. Um, it's a function of the radius, the bulk density, the escape law. I mean, it's, it's everything, but if there's, but it doesn't really show that much. Um, a an Earth similarity index of 0.99 doesn't mean that there's life on it. And that kind of throws people off. So we're going to take a look at some of these high ESI planets. <coughs> Excuse me. And see if see what's going on. So we're back to here. You can see, by the way, uh, Earth has an ESI of 1. Mars has an ESI of about 0.6. Uh, Venus is about 0.5. So you can see that, you know, they think maybe there's something on Mars, but it only has a, like a 0.665 or something like that. Anyway, but let's go ahead and get our chart on there. And these are the stars that I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to look at Tea Garden stars, Trappist, Proxima Centauri, uh, JG 1061. Um, so we have lots and lots of different stars there. And um, I'm going to show you why there could be or maybe not life on each of those. <coughs> okay, let's start off with T Garden Star. I mean, since that has the highest of 0.95. I mean, that sounds like a slam dunk to me. So Tea Garden Star, um, first of all, it had absolutely nothing to do with Kepler's, the Kepler probe. It was discovered actually by, uh, by using uh, the, the orbiting uh, planet method. So there it is. It's a red dwarf star. You can see its habitable zone is well on there. And see, it has two planets, planet B and planet C. And you can see that both of them are well within the habitable zone. But it's planet B that has the 0.95. So how was this thing even discovered? I mean, it's amazing. Well, actually, it was discovered with another program. It was discovered by using something called data mining. Everything that the astronomer sees in the sky is archived. So if you want to see something or uh, discover something uh, that might be uh, on some data that's 20 years old, you would have to find where it was, at least where the data was taken, and then go through its archives in order to find the particular data that you're looking for. So it was archived uh, according to a program called NEAT, which is the Near Earth Asteroid Tracking System. And it was actually designed to find objects that are within 20 light years of the Earth. And wouldn't you know it, they found 
an object that they've never seen before that was within 20 light years of the Earth. And there it is. That definitely makes a big impression, doesn't it? Over eight years, that's how much it moved. Well, that happens to be the star known as Tea Garden. And watching it, they noticed that the star was indicating that there was something going around it. And what, were go what was going around it were two planets. The next object is Gliese 1061. And Gliese 1061 was just discovered within the past year, year and a half. It's 12 light years away. And so, and this was uh, again used uh, through Kepler. And this one is also going around a red dwarf star. But if you take a look at the orbits, they do dip well inside the red zone. In fact, it looks like one orbit overlays the other. How could this be in the habitable zone? Well, it kind of is, at least for most of the year. So as a result, this, uh, this planet is, uh, is considered to be a possibility. It has an Earth uh, similarity index of 0.86, which means it's a rocky planet. It's a planet that shows uh, at least a similar temperature, at least for most of the time. So this one, I'm not sure this one would, would have life like us. I'm not sure if it would even have microbial life because when it gets close to that red dwarf star, it does get kind of hot. It might sterilize the surface. Next one is Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is only 4.6 light years away. That's a hop, skip, and a jump. Well, we can do that in about 30,000 years if on conventional, uh, a conventional rocket. If we were to travel uh, somewhere in the vicinity of about, uh, well, let's say about a fifth of the speed of light, it would still take us about 30 years to get there. I don't think I want to spend a weekend out there. Anyway, it has an ESI of, of 0.87, which would, it's better than Mars but it's still going around a red dwarf star. And a red dwarf star uh, has its problems. It doesn't give a whole lot of light. Um, and it does dip well inside of a, it's, they call that the optimistic zone. Uh, that's, I'm not quite sure why they call it that because it's well within it's well inside the habitable zone, but I guess astronomers are optimists. Next one is the TRAPPIST system. The TRAPPIST system has seven planets. Three of them are actually within the habitable zone. And the uh, Trappist uh, D, I believe it is, is the one that they feel might be the one that is most possibly have the uh, possibility of life. But the fact of the matter is that if you take the solar system that makes up the Trappist system, it is actually that small. 
it's a tiny little solar system that would actually fit within the orbit of Mercury. So uh, the D, Trappist D, uh, may or may not be, you know, have the right stuff to have anything living on it. The, the one good thing about this is the fact that the orbit is circular. There's none of this dipping within uh, the unhabitable zones within the star. Then we have the Kepler 186 system. Uh, Kepler 186 has an ESI of 0.61. Now, the trouble is, this is more than a hop, skip, and a jump away. It's 579 light years away. <clears throat> but I guess you do have to travel to get someplace you want to go to, or something like that. But if you were to go there, uh, once again, the Kepler system is uh, actually revolving about a red, uh, a red dwarf star. And as a result, um, it's not the best place uh, to have anything habitable. We'll get into that in a minute. But they've made lots and lots of neat pictures about uh, Kepler 186f orbiting its red star. They even have a nice sunset, which I thought looked interesting because it has lots of water on there, but not quite sure if it does. Now, why, why are so many of these things orbiting red stars? Well, red class M stars are actually the most numerous stars that scientists have been able to find. They're everywhere. Our stars like our sun are a lot rarer, but red uh, dwarf stars are everywhere. So uh, that's why there are just so many of them. Comparing our Earth to Kepler 186f, uh, you can see that it's very similar to our star uh, in the fact that uh, it's very close to our mass. It's very close to our radius. Uh, it's about one third of a year to revolve about its star. So it could have an atmosphere and, a, and water uh, similar to ours. Trouble is, it is just plain too far away. Taking a closer look at the planetary systems, you can see that it's very similar in placement within the habitable zone uh, to where Mars is. So you can see that as far as our habitable zone is concerned, the Earth is on the inner edge. So, uh, you know, we're, we're just not, um, seems like we shouldn't be here, but there we are. But uh, Kepler 186f is in the middle of its zone or towards a little bit toward the outer edge and uh, should be more like Mars. Again, it has a ESI or Earth similarity of 0.8. Next, we have Gliese 667. And Gliese 667. C is a again a red dwarf star. Uh, the planet that is within the habitable zone is six six seven CC. It's about three point seven times the Earth's mass, 
and it is considered to be a super Earth. In other words, it is much larger than our Earth. We don't know if the extra gravity uh, would, would be a detriment to life, but it might, it might be. Um, unless the, no, again, what makes all these planets doubtful that there's life on it is the fact that all of these planets are orbiting, at least all the ones I've talked to today, are orbiting red dwarf stars. And red dwarf stars have a habit of occasionally have uh, realizing a tremendous flash, a tremendous release of radioactive flares. If this happens while life is being formed on one of these planets, it will sterilize the planet. What protects us, or what protected us, was the fact that we had a magnetic uh, field around the Earth, which protected the Earth from these flares. Our sun flared occasionally also. If these planets that I've just talked about do not have this magnetic field, then life on these planets would not have had the chance to start and flourish. If we take a look at our own uh, solar system, we can find that our habitable zone is right there. You can see that we, the Earth, is on the inner edge. Mars is about two thirds, a little bit more, uh, further out. And uh, everything else is in the clear. So it's it, the assumption would be that anything beyond where our habitable zone ends would be incapable of having any kind of life. That is not true. There are, there are two uh, actually moons that go around Jupiter. Actually, one moon goes around Jupiter, the other one goes around Saturn, that have liquid water on it. If liquid water is the thing that makes life possible, then these two moons, Europa and Enceladus, Enceladus, would have the possibility of life on it. But that's, uh, that's assuming life as we know it, <clears throat> life that would require uh, water. Does all type of life require water? The simple answer to that is, we don't know. Titan a moon going around Saturn has an amazing chemistry. The atmosphere of Titan is largely nitrogen. Minor components lead to the formation of methane and ethane clouds and heavy organonitrogen haze. The climate, including wind and rain, create surface features similar to those of Earth, such as dunes, rivers, lakes, seas, probably of liquid methane and ethane. And deltas. It is dominated by seasonal weather patterns similar to the Earth. 
with its liquids, both surface and subsurface, and robust nitrogen atmosphere. The Titan's methane cycle has a striking similarity to Earth's water cycle. It rains methane, and then it evaporates. It rises up into the clouds where it rains methane again. Albeit this is a much lower temperature, somewhere in the vicinity of about uh, 290 degrees below zero. Titan is already a hive of chemical activity. The nitrogen and methane break up in the sunlight, triggering a cascade of chemical reactions. Whether those reactions result in life, nobody will know until we get there again. We've been there and it's already raised more questions. The way we are going to learn is starting this October, we're going to be launching the Webb Telescope. It will, with its infrared um, uh, capabilities, be able to see through a lot of the clouds that are on Titan. And we'll learn an awful lot more about Titan and other planets as well. It'll be able to find planets well beyond our solar system. So that's going to be a neat thing uh, that will happen. Meanwhile, have we ever been visited? Do we want to go out there and meet, you know, meet aliens or meet people that would be like us? Well, I don't know. One of the things that I worried about was the fact that they might have microbes, viruses that would that would take us over, that would that, that would uh, destroy us. But we've learned how to fight those viruses. We've learned how to take a virus that we knew nothing about and actually create a vaccine against it. So in my mind, that capability has prepared us to be able to visit another planet or be able to at least converse with some other alien that would come to us. But do we want that? Well, according to one scientist, we don't. That scientist is Dr. Stephen Hawking. And if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America, which didn't turn out well for the Native Americans. We only have to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life, and I think we consider ourselves intelligent life, might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. So, so maybe we don't want to have aliens visit us, and we certainly don't want to meet the thing on the lower side there. Okay, um, next, this is the last lecture for this series. Um, I hope you enjoyed the series. And uh, next week, I am hopeful that we will be out at the observatory. I'll be out there, uh, hopefully, with a telescope at around 9 o'clock, and we'll be able to see some stuff. Um, if it is cloudy, I won't be there, but there will be a note on the gate. So um, I'd like to thank thank all of you for uh, sitting through my lectures and my, my talks, uh, sometimes with uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, with conjecture, I think. <laughs> It kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, we'll get started here. I like that one. I like this one. This is so neat. <laughs> 